Okay, I'll admit that the Saab Vigan is far from a forgotten aircraft. But as it has always been one of my favourites, especially the fighter variant that I'm covering here, I decided I was going to do it anyway. Besides, look at it. It's gorgeous. Anyway, to provide a few details of the Vigan. The Saab Vigan, which broadly translates as Thunderbolt, evolved from a 1960s requirement from the Swedish Air Force to replace both the Saab Lansen in the attack role and the Draken as a fighter interceptor. And yes, I will get round to the, both of those one day. If anyone at Saab is watching, any help would be appreciated. Anyway, preliminary design and experimental work was conducted in the 1950s, and things were boosted in 1960, when the Eisenhower administration signed a defence agreement with Sweden. This not only offered US military assistance to the Swedes in the event of an attack by the Soviet Union, it also gave them access to cutting-edge aeronautic equipment for use in their indigenous aircraft. This would mean the overheads of the Vigan program would be vastly reduced by cutting a lot of the development costs. And these savings would largely be ploughed back into the program to allow the Swedes to create what was at the time the most advanced combat aircraft being built in Europe. Which is quite an achievement when you think about it. Four initial versions of the Vigan would be built. The AJ-37 attack aircraft, the SH-37 for maritime strike, the SF-37 reconnaissance variant, and the SK-37 two-seat trainer. These all prototyped and entered service in the late 1960s and early 1970s, while the final variant was being developed, the JA-37 all-weather fighter. This was given development authorization in 1972 by the Swedish government, and the first prototype flew in 1974. In appearance, it can be difficult to tell the JA from its AJ attack-oriented sibling. Both use a canard-winged tailless delta design in common with all of the Vigans, and the same basic airframe constructed of aluminium in a bonded honeycomb structure. This makes sense, as all of the Vigans were built to a high-performance specification that meant that they had to be capable of Mach 2 at altitude, Mach 1 at low level, and of operating off extremely short strips or even civilian roads as runways. This was the reason for the adoption of the canard configuration. In contrast to later fighters that have adopted this largely for combat maneuverability, the Vigan's requirement for excellent stall abilities means that the large canards provided huge additional lift for landing and takeoff. In fact, in terms of air combat maneuverability, the JA suffered as other previous Delta Wing fighters had from high drag in hard turns and was very much in a middle category as a dogfighter between the earlier F-4 Phantom and the later teen aircraft and the MiG-29 and Su-27. It did have a few airframe tweaks over the earlier variants to improve the aircraft for its role as a fighter. Structurally, the JA was reinforced to cope better with the stresses of air combat. The main wing also had an additional flap to improve maneuverability, and the fuselage was 100mm longer than the other variants. The JA-37's differences were largely hidden internally in an electronic suite designed to make it an extremely capable air supremacy fighter. The nose housed an Ericsson PS-46A Pulse Doppler multi-mode radar. This had a publicly stated range of 30 miles, 48 kilometers, and provided the JA-37 with a look-down shoot-down capability and was totally state-of-the-art at the time. Additionally, Saab were able to integrate cutting-edge navigation systems digital processors and one of the first automatic flight control units to go into production anywhere. They additionally were able to use the same digital air data computer as the F-14 Tomcat, which was itself just coming into service. Shows how close the Swedes and the United States were on technology exchange. The JA-37 also used a more powerful version of the Volvo RM8B turbofan than the other variants. This engine a licensed-built Pratt & Whitney JT-8D with substantial modifications, produced 28,100 pounds of force, 125 kilonewtons, in afterburner, making it the second most powerful fighter aircraft engine in use at the time after the MiG-23's Tomansky R-29. This propelled the JA-37 to a top-listed speed of Mach 2.1. The JA also differed in having a partial glass display cockpit, featuring a head-down display and a tactical display for the pilot. And, with its focus on air combat, the JA's weapons were much superior to the strike variants of the Vigan. The primary weapon was the Skyflash, a British improvement on the American AIM-7 Sparrow radar-guided missile. This was built under license in Sweden as the RB-71, 
and two could be carried under the JA-37's wings. This was supplemented by up to four Sidewinder heat seekers, which were also built in Sweden under license. Initially these were the AIM-9B and J variants, but would be replaced by the more capable AIM-9L during the Vigan's service life. Additionally, the JA featured a much more powerful cannon than the earlier models. The AJ-37 was not fitted with a fixed cannon, instead having the option of carrying twin under-fuselage pods, each fitted with a 30mm Aiden cannon. The JA-37 swapped this for a cannon fitted in a belly pack that was offset to the left. This carried a single Orlikon KCA 30mm cannon, which was considerably more powerful than the Aiden. Firing the same shells as the fearsome GAU-8 rotary cannon on the A-10 tank buster, the KCA was a very hard-hitting aircraft cannon. The JA-37 also retained some ground attack capability, but this was largely limited to air-to-ground rockets and dumb bombs. The JA-37 entered service with the Swedish Air Force in 1980, and proved a formidable addition to the service, gradually replacing the Drakon as the primary interceptor. And they were certainly kept busy. With the Cold War taking a turn for the tents in the 1980s, the Swedes found themselves effectively on the front line of the intrusions launched by both sides against one another. But while Soviet aircraft were constantly testing the Swedish Air Force's abilities to defend their airspace, there was another intruder that routinely passed close to Sweden and which the JA-37 pilots were keen to test themselves against. American SR-71 Blackbirds routinely ran what was nicknamed the Baltic Express, flying a loop in international airspace over the Baltic Sea to conduct recon missions on the Polish and Soviet coastlines. As the fastest aircraft in the world, these were extremely difficult aircraft to intercept, and the Swedes' Drakens had proven incapable of the job. The Vigan changed that. With its powerful engine and, more importantly, advanced radar and electronic counter-countermeasures, the Vigan did prove capable of intercepting the SR-71 and achieving a lock despite the American aircraft's electronic jammers. And on one occasion in 1987, JA-37s intercepted a Blackbird with engine trouble and effectively escorted it out of the Baltic, handing it off to USAF F-15s. The United States Air Force were impressed with the Vigan and admitted that the JA-37, if carefully managed, could provide the performance to reach within striking range of an SR-71. As pointed out by the USAF, Blackbird interceptions were achieved under the most favourable of circumstances, but this still showed how competent an aircraft the Vigan was. The success is also attributed to another system that was integrated into the Vigan, the Strill 60. This was one of the first digitally data-linked air defence systems to enter service, and during the 1980s, both it and the JA-37 underwent regular updates. This meant that the aircraft and the air defence network interacted with greater efficiency and integration as the decade wore on, leading to the ability of a single Vigan to illuminate targets for three other aircraft to engage with their missiles whilst staying passive. Production of the Vigan ended in 1990, with the last off the line being a JA-37. In total, 149 JA-37s were built, out of a total run of 338 Vigans of all types. Attempts to market the aircraft were ongoing throughout the aircraft's lifespan, including an attempt to win orders from the United States Air Force in the lightweight fighter competition, which ultimately was won by the F-16. There was also this serious possibility of licensed production being undertaken in India, though I think this was for the attack variant. However, had the sale not been blocked by the United States due to technology transfer concerns, it is completely conceivable that the IAF might well have decided to build fighter Vigans of their own. Despite the lack of sales, the Vigan remained the primary fighter aircraft of the Swedish Air Force into the 1990s. Although the new Saab Gripen would start to replace the Vigan in all roles from 1994 onwards, the Vigan would remain a critical aircraft for another decade. This led to the creation of the JA-37D and DI models, which saw major overhauls of the aircraft's electronics. Most notable of these upgrades was the ability to carry and use four AMRAAM missiles in place of the older Sky Flashes. The JA-37Ds would provide not just an updated fighter for the Swedes, but also a useful transition type to the new Grippens. But the newer fighter, built firmly in the tradition of the Vigan as a cutting-edge aircraft featuring the best available technology, displaced the old Thunderbolts in service by the mid-2000s. Now the Vigans are to be found languishing in museums, 
though several are kept airworthy for displays, and one day I hope very much to see one flying myself.